Good evening. Uh, tonight, I want to ask you to go ahead and open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 2. Uh, Joshua chapter 2. We're going to spend pretty much all of our time here. We'll look at a few other scriptures towards the end, but for the most part, we're going to be here in Joshua, and we're going to talk about a story that's pretty familiar uh, to a lot of people and a particular person uh, who also uh, is pretty familiar, I believe, to a lot of people. But I want to point out some things that that maybe, uh, maybe you've not thought of uh, before or not realized uh, some other things that are kind of said about this particular individual. So Joshua 2 is where we're going to be. And as you get here, um, God's people are on the doorsteps of the promised land. And uh, they're ready to take what is there. theirs. Joshua is going to lead them in this endeavor. The plan is to do this city by city, gradually retaking uh, the land that God's promised them. So here we have them uh, in Joshua 2. They're crossing over the Jordan River, and they're staring down the city of Jericho. And so Jericho is a familiar uh, story to a lot of people. Um, and a lot of things happen there that are, that are unique and pretty awesome, pretty incredible. Uh, what God does with the city of Jericho and with his people to take over that city uh, and make the walls fall down. Uh, but before you get to that particular occurrence, something else happens. Uh, so Joshua is going to send two men on a recon mission uh, to kind of see what do we need to do to take this land, to be ready to go, to win. Uh, what kind of what kind of army do they have? What does the town look like? What what kind of areas are surrounding the town to where we could get in from a certain area? Would it be better to go here or over here? So he's going to send these two men to go on a recon mission of, of this town. So picking up in verses 1 and 2 of Joshua 2. Jo now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. And so we're already introduced to our main person tonight that I want to talk about, and that is Rahab. And she's already labeled uh, here for us to give us an idea of who she was and what she did. Rahab the harlot, or the harlot Rahab. Uh, other scripture you might see or your translation might call her a prostitute. And so we have Rahab as this woman that, uh, that they come across as these spies enter into the land. So they come there, they lodge in her house. Um, verses 3 through 5 as, as we get ready to pick up. The king sends out his own search party to figure out who these spies are and catch them if he can. So... Uh, verses 3, the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who've come to you, who've entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. I think a lot of times we come here to this scripture and people want to try to use this occasion as an excuse to say that lying is okay because Rahab misleads the king's men. But we need to be careful because this text is not about making lying okay. It's not about justifying lying in any way. We need to realize the importance of this text and why it's in the Bible for us to read. And so we're going to get to what we can pull from this story, but I want to encourage you, as you come to stories like this, don't automatically try to make uh, connections that aren't there or try to justify actions that you know are wrong. We know that lying is sinful, and so we need to be careful about trying to justify lying just because Rahab is misleading in her conversation here. But as we continue uh, through this story, Rahab leads the authorities on this wild goose chase, if you will. She takes the men up to the roof, and, and she hides the spies on the roof. Uh, as soon as the the men the king's men are out of sight there, uh, or well, takes them to the roof to hide them. When the king's men are out of sight, they can make their escape. So let's pick up in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. As you read this, flax was a plant 
the finer parts of the plant were used for making linen, which is a saw cloth, and the coarser parts of the plant were woven together uh, into twine, and the twine was eventually braided together into rope. Like many in her day, uh, Rahab probably had a little family business on the roof where she uh, would dye cloth and cord. She specialized in red, which is why we're going to see the mention of scarlet thread here in just a moment. She specialized in red, just much like Lydia in the book of Acts specialized in purple, a seller of fine purple. So Rahab probably had this other business that she did uh, with red uh, cloth, red uh, cord that she would sell. Um, but uh, before they leave, Rahab tells the spies something. So if you pick back up in verse 9, she says, uh, and she said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And then verse 11, And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So as they're getting ready to leave, verse 9 says, I know the Lord has given you this land. The name she uses for Lord here is the highest ranking word that she could come up with, the most powerful name that she could think of, and that is Elohim in the Hebrew. She identifies the Hebrew God as God over all other gods. She cites what God's already done in their deliverance when she talks about crossing the Red Sea, defeating Sihon and, and uh, Og there, the kings that are mentioned uh, that they defeated. She's like, I've heard, we've heard these stories. We know the stories and that your God is the one who is delivering you. He, we know that he is the God of gods. And so she says all these things. And um, she identifies their God's the victor. She cites what God's done to deliver them. She identifies him as God of both heaven and earth. But then she asks for a favor in verse 12. Now, therefore, connecting back to what she's just said about their God. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. She knows they're going to be defeated because if, if this God is the one that's leading this people, there's no way they can defeat that God who parted the Red Sea, who's done all these other incredible things uh, for his people. That God's going to be victorious. We know that, but spare us. When you come to take the land, don't I, I've done this nice thing for you. Don't kill us too. Spare us in your battle. So, verse, um, verses 3, Verse 14, the men answers her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So Rahab helps the spies escape with a rope uh, through the window and instructs them on how to uh, avoid the army, how to get out and leave the city undetected. But there are conditions uh, to their safety during the battle. If you pick up in verse 17, the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. So there are guidelines for the protection of, of Rahab and her family. First of all, she has to tie the scarlet thread on her window. Secondly, if anybody wants to be safe that's in her family, they have to be in her house that's protected by that scarlet thread that's on her window. And then thirdly, they say, if, if you go out of the house, if anybody comes out of the house, 
We're not responsible for their blood being shed. If you don't put the thread on your, your window, we're not responsible for whatever happens to you. If, if they do come to your house, you have the thread on the window, and something still happens to them, that's on, uh, that's on us. We're responsible for that. So they, they make this oath. They agree to it. They say, um, if you do these things, we'll stick to the oath. If you don't do these things, we are not responsible for what happens. So tie the scarlet cord around your window, bring your family into your house, and stay there through the battle, and you'll be safe. Is there any significance to the red rope? It wasn't a magical piece of thread. It wasn't something so unique and different and and blessed by God that it would just put up this shield of protection around this particular house. But it was a showing of trust and faith on Rahab's part to tie it to the window. Why a piece of thread? Why tie it to the window? Well, they could see the the cord, I'm sure, and know that, okay, this is the house we're not supposed to attack, right? But it was a testament of faith, a testing of faith. Okay, you made all these claims about our God and your belief that He is the God of gods, that He did all these amazing things, that He'll be victorious. If you really want to be delivered and if you really believe that our God is this powerful, do this thing to prove that. I'm reminded here of Naaman and when he's confronted because he's told to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and he doesn't want to do that because it's a nasty river and the man confronts him and says, you know, if if they had told you to do some grand spectacle or do something extravagant or incredible, you would have done it. But because it's something so simple as going into this river and because this river is not clean and nice and good because it's a dirty, nasty river and you uh, don't want to go into it and it's not something grand for everybody else to see, you're not going to do it. It doesn't make much sense. And he kind of calls out Naaman. You know, sometimes I feel like we want to prove our faith, but then it's the things that we see that God says, okay, you need to do these kind of things and this shows your faith in me and your trust in me. But sometimes it's not the extravagant stuff and so no one else will see it. And so we don't want to do it unless someone else sees it. And then there's also the other end of the spectrum where it might not make much sense. Why the Jordan River? Why seven times? Why tie a a scarlet thread on the window? Can't God just make them know that this is the house that's protected? It's a showing of, of your trust and your faith in God. And maybe one thing we pull from this story of Rahab is, are we willing to do the little things that might not make a whole lot of sense to, to show our true faith in God as the God, as the one true living God, as, as our God? Are we willing to do these things to prove how, how strong our faith is? Or are we waiting for a moment when people are watching us so they can praise us for our faith? Or are we waiting for God uh, to tell us something that we think makes sense versus just doing what he says to do, whether or not it makes sense at the time? Are we willing to listen to God's instructions to show how strong our faith is? So, um, ultimately, it's the symbol of, of faith for Rahab to tie this scarlet thread, the scarlet rope. Um, and so, as we think of that, the spies return to let Joshua know what all they had discovered. They tell uh, that the entire city is scared to death, um, and taking the city is going to be easier than they thought. If you look at verse uh, 24, they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord delivered all the land into our hands. For indeed, all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. So they're pretty confident that they're going to win this battle. Um, Now what follows in the next chapters of God's instructions of taking the city, you know, they walk around the city one time a day for six days, then on the seventh day they do it for seven times. He he gives them uh, this this instruction on what to do, on what to shout, on what to, uh, how to interact each day. And so everything goes as planned. They end up taking the city. And notice, if you flip over to Joshua chapter 6, Joshua chapter 6, and let's look together at verse 25. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. 
Again, notice the label that's connected with her. When we're introduced to her, she sa it says that the spies come to this the, the harlot Rahab's house. Now, it says Joshua spared Rahab the harlot. It's like this connection to her name that she can't seem to get rid of. The har Why does that have to be said, the harlot? Rahab the harlot. The harlot Rahab. Why is that important? We're going to get there. But they, they stick to their oath. They follow through because she followed through and did what they asked her to do. Pop culture often gives us characters with nicknames. For example, uh, you might think of Conan the Barbarian, this connector to the name. Uh, Dennis the Menace. I remember that, watching that movie as a little kid, and I used to love that movie. Uh, and, then, and I think there was a TV show as well, Dennis the Menace. But then today for kids, you have things like Bob the Builder or Dora the Explorer. In the title, it tells you what they do, that connector to their name. And for Rahab, in Scripture, it's, it's interesting because in constant connection with her name is that title, the prostitute or the harlot. There are two other references in the New Testament to Rahab, really three when you look at, at uh, the genealogy of, of Jesus we're going to get to in a minute. But before that, uh, not including that, there are two other main ones that I want to look at. Hebrews 11 and verse 31, in the Hall of Fame of the Faithful, you have Rahab mentioned. It says, It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She welcomed the spies, and then she tied that red rope around her window for protection in her house. And so you have this moment of faith. But even in this telling of her great faith, what is the connector that's, that's put with her name? Rahab the prostitute or the harlot. James 2 and verse 25 says, Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Now granted, at some point, uh, she at some point stopped practicing that, life, that lifestyle, that harlotry. She had stopped doing that. Eventually she gets married and she has a child. But the nickname is still connected to her. Something for you to think about, and we don't have an exact answer, but why do you think, as we read through Scripture, that it's constantly connected with her name? That even though her lifestyle changes, she gets married, she has a child, which we're going to see in just a moment, why is the harlot or the prostitute, why is that still connected to her name after she's been delivered in Joshua 6 and verse 25? Uh, and after she's been spared. Why is it still mentioned in Hebrews 11 when we're talking about the Hall of Fame of the Faithful? Verse 31 describes her as the prostitute or the harlot. Why in James 2 and verse 25 is she again labeled in that way? Why isn't it a name that, a nickname that doesn't go with her anymore? Why is it stuck? Some things that um, we can think about. Um that maybe we don't have an actual answer to, but as you kind of think about it, you might can come up with similar answers. She didn't remove the rope, right? She put the rope on there and she kept it there. It remained in place as she waded through the crazy tactics of, of the Israelites um, and they kept their promise through it all. Maybe this is why the nickname is continues to be with her throughout Scripture. It's hard for us to understand how God uh, in this moment, he spares a, a, a foreigner or a, an outsider, an enemy, someone the law says should be killed. Perhaps the name stuck with her to remind us that God is willing and able to save anyone who is willing to turn away from sin and put their trust in him and show that faith and that trust in him. God is willing to save, to spare anybody. Um, it's interesting, Rahab she did not just live among the Israelites, but she becomes one of them. Ultimately, she marries a man named Salmon, uh, an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Her son was Boaz, who um, is the husband of Ruth. Joseph, the legal father of Jesus, is a direct descendant of her. So as you look at this and you wonder why the connection with this title, maybe one reason is to remind us that God is able and willing to save whoever will turn away from sin and turn to Him. But also, and 
as you can kind of look through Rahab, that gives us a good idea of, of, of him doing that. But it, it's incredible to me to think. Go to Matthew chapter 1. This woman who, who lived this way, was caught up in all this sin because of her turning away from it. When you go and you begin to read through the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew 1 and verse 5, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. This woman who is labeled as the, the harlot, that's how we're introduced to her. That's how, as you continue to read through Scripture, she's constantly referenced every time she's mentioned, except here. This woman that was caught up in sin is mentioned in the genealogy of our Savior. God is willing and God is able to save any of us that are caught up in sin. But if we are unwilling to tie the rope around our house, if we are unwilling to do the things that God says we must do to get away from sin, to prove faith, to show faith, then he's not responsible for what happens. And so as you look at at the story of Rahab, I ask you, what title is connected to your name? You have Rahab the harlot. What sin do you struggle with that can be tacked on at the end of your name? And is it tacked on at the end of your name as a reminder that God is willing and able to save everyone and anyone who is willing to turn away from sin and as a reminder that you turned away from sin you turned to God? Or is it tacked on at the end of your name because it's, it's this sin that you continue to dwell in and to struggle with? And if it's the latter, if it's that you continue to struggle with it so it's at the end of your name because... That's a definition right now. Maybe others don't know if that's a definition of who you are right now. If that's it, let Rahab be a reminder to you that if you are willing to repent of those sins, to turn away from sin and turn to God and put your full faith and trust in God and whatever He says do, if you're willing to do that, then you can be saved. Jesus died on the cross, not just for some sins, but for all sin. For the most awful of sins. People can be forgiven, but it requires putting that faith and that trust in God. It requires this repentance and turning away from that sinful lifestyle, confessing this faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and immersion, being baptized into the watery grave of baptism so that the blood of Jesus washes away your sins and when you come up out of the water, your sins are washed away. You're a new person with a new name. You're wearing new clothes. And you're living a new life with a new purpose. Are we willing to do the things that God asks us to do even when they don't make much sense? They might not make much sense to us at the time. Are we willing to put our full faith and trust in God and let go of the sin that we're caught up in? Or are we too concerned with that sin and too committed to that sin that we're unwilling to do whatever it is God wants us and needs us to do to be forgiven of that sin. As you look at a person like Rahab, this constant reminder, the harlot, the prostitute Rahab, but then you go and you read the genealogy of Jesus and you see that that's a person that's mentioned in the genealogy. That's a person whose life turned around and was completely different and she put her faith in God and trust in Him. It shows us that anybody can be saved, but they have to be willing to do what God asks them to do to, uh, to be saved from sin. And so tonight, if you need prayers, um, you can offer those prayers, but if you need others to pray for you, we're going to have our contact information on the screen in just a second. Please contact us and let us know, and we can pray together over the phone uh, for right now until this quarantine is over. Or... Maybe you're not a Christian, and so prayer alone is not enough to take away your sins. You need the blood of Jesus. 
And so maybe tonight you're watching this and you're not a child of God. You've never been immersed uh, for the remission of your sins. Maybe tonight what you need is to obey the gospel. There are precautions and steps that we can take and are willing to take for anyone who is willing to give their life to Jesus. Tonight, if you have a sin that's tacked on at the end of your name because you can't seem to get rid of it, but you're willing to let it go and to get rid of it, if you'll repent of your sins, turn away from them, turn away from that lifestyle, if you'll confess your faith in Jesus as the Son of God like the eunuch in Acts 8, and if you're willing to be immersed into the waters of baptism this evening, you can contact us, we'll meet you at the building, and we'll make it happen. The blood of Jesus is the only way we can be forgiven of sins. And if you have a sin in your life tonight that's got a hold of you and you need to be forgiven of it and you're not a Christian, the only way to be forgiven of it is to be immersed into the blood of Jesus and let the power of the blood of Jesus cleanse you and wash you and make you whiter than snow. Are you willing to put your full faith and trust in Jesus? Are you willing to tie that rope around your heart to show uh, that you trust God with everything that you have? If you are, please contact us and let us know, and we'll do whatever we can to help you. Thank you so much for tuning in to all of these videos. Uh, again, if there's anything you need from us, we're here for you. We'll do whatever we can do to help you in this time as we're in different circumstances, and we'll try our best to, to meet the needs that you have. We ask that you continue to tune in as we continue to post these videos. Uh, we hope that you and your families are remaining safe and, and healthy, um, and Again, we just we hope that you have a good rest of your evening. And again, we thank you for tuning in tonight to this video. Uh, God bless.